So I've been making these little books, uh, uh, and the most recent one is Bad Poetry, and um, the introduction was written by Matthew Zapruder. I don't know if there are any Matthew Zapruder fans. Oh! <laughs> so there are. Uh, and so I didn't give a, get a chance to give a toast at his wedding, which I think was two days ago, if I'm not mistaken. So I, I prepared a little something. No, I didn't. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> It'd be really fucked up. Um, I just want to say that time we both got drunk and we both felt it, but we didn't act on it, but it's cool. Sarah's great. And, uh, um, just spitballing. Um, so the point is that he wrote uh, an introduction to this book, which I'm not going to read because it's so much better than anything else in the book. Uh, that would kind of be bad. Uh, and I also got to include, he allowed me to include his beautiful poem, Pocket, uh, which I'm also not going to read because it will embarrass me uh, after you hear what I, the kind of poetry I write. Uh, so instead I'm just going to read, this is made up of just a bunch of poems that people say, oh, that's cool, you wrote this when you were in high school. Everybody's got some of those bad high school poems uh, hidden away. And I have to say, well, actually, I wrote them uh, in my 30s. Uh, oh, well, you know, I'm ready to get started at different times. I actually, I finished my MFA. Uh, and I'm still writing these poems. So that's cool. Um, all right, so uh, I'll just read the poem, and, and then uh, there's a little bit afterwards. This is called Ode to Water, um, but it's O-W-E-D. It's your first indication of trouble. It is said the ocean forgets every, I always want to do it in the poet voice. It is said the ocean forgets everything. You know what I mean? Like every syllable is made of gold. Forgets the lash of lightning. Maybe I'll do some Slam poetry gestures too. I think I'm gonna bring those in. Forgets the lash of lightning and the stones it grinds to sand and the planks it swallows without joy or renunciation. <laughs> which I now want to rhyme with many other shun words, but will not. Our way is to get our way is to condemn reckless water. We like water we can walk upon. Yeah, it's so true. <laughs> or stare into or pour down our funnel throats. Oh my god, it is like a funnel. We like water that plays at tranquility. A flatness laid like maps across everything. No gestures. We might have come from uh, we might have come from this placid body, might have grown smooth skin and flippers and holes to breathe from those insistent pisses which order us home to our villages. Yeah, totally. The speaker of this poem is totally from a village. <laughs> to our wives and children, to hearths, and he has a hearth, murmuring with stew, yep, it does, and black earth, of course it's black, we trench and feed sun, raising salt water on our skin. Profound pause at my profundity. <laughs> Could I get any deeper? I suspect not. I rubbed this one out back in the Clinton heyday, the proximate cause being the reading delivered by a poetess named Maxine, beautiful in a disheveled manner with knee-high boots and a pleather skirt. She was married to an older gentleman, but I was convinced that I had only to write a poem of sufficient feeling, and she would come to her senses. So it was a love poem. What poem isn't? What I admire so much here is the utter imprecision of my thinking, the lunging about for high-impact words and associations. I sort of dare you to try to map the logic of this poem. Or maybe no, punch yourself in the throat. That would be more relaxing. Bad poets want so much to sound good. That's basically all we want. Funneled throats, insistent hisses, Reading this lap now is like watching my one-year-old stagger across the kitchen. Every time he manages to get a foot down without falling, his little ego bursts into flame. And did I summon the nerve to read this poem to Maxine? I'm afraid I did. <laughs> wow. 
Those 35 seconds and, in particular, the stunned after moments of silence were really a major human event. I put Maxine in quite a spot. She was being wooed by a one-year-old. I realize I don't have many teeth, I was saying to her, and I still shit myself every few hours and my neck often smells like rancid cheese, but I'm pretty sure I have everything you could ever desire in a lover. And she was trapped there on the other end of the line, breathing quietly and wishing to be out of kindness more than anything else, for she was a kind woman, not alive. Wow, she said finally. I really like the language. She liked the language so much, she had to go. She was so enamored of my ode, ode, and so confusingly in love with its maker that hanging up was her only option. It was invigorating to wield that kind of power. I was ready to swallow a plank without joy or renunciation. I was ready to condemn some reckless water. I was ready to murmur some goddamn hearths with stew. Who's with me, people? So, um, um, selling these little books, uh, and actually, uh, it's a sort of a, as I've described it, it's kind of a drug dealer model. Uh, rather than there being any credit card or any commodification of the, of the artifact, it's just you buy it in cash, uh, the bad poetry and letters from people who hate me are five bucks, those are the nickel bags, and then the, the other one, uh, this won't take but a minute, honey, which I'll read from in a minute, are ten, and all the proceeds, 100%, I often give to uh, Doctors Without Borders, but I love what Nato Green is doing. If he freaked your fucking liberal asses out, imagine what he is going to do when he gets into uh, the, the real America, Sarah Palin's real America. I am, I hope there's video. Um, I would like to deploy them to go to every town hall ever. I would like Nato Green to be the central speaker, audience speaker at every town hall ever. I think we'd have a different country. Or he'd be dead, but in either event. Um, so if anybody wants to buy those, please do, and all the proceeds go to uh, Laughter Against the Machine, which I think is, I mean, pretty much all we're left with as a moral backstop at this point is comedy, which is our fault, but it's also, comedy's powerful, you can say shit. Uh, so uh, letters from people who hate me, surprisingly, are a series of letters from people who hate me, uh, usually based on my politics, and so I will, um, I'll read a couple of uh, these letters. I write various um, uh, communist tracts for newspapers and stuff and get really angry letters. Uh, so uh, let me just read a couple of them. Steve, you need to sit down and seriously consider how your words, uh, this was, I wrote a column about uh, the use of the support the truths mantra as a kind of way of uh, not providing the necessary moral and administrative oversight of how we use our military. That's a basic point. It's kind of like sixth grade logic. Like, don't send them out to die unless you really thought about it. Okay. Uh, all right, so, uh, and then here are a series of responses. Steve, you need to sit down and seriously consider how your words disrespect the people who protect you and your daughter. My best friend had the courage to join the military because he wants to serve his country. He has more moral and spiritual fortitude than I ever would. Your daughter has every reason to be ashamed of you when she grows up. These people, interestingly, I think they find these letters very touching in a certain bad touching kind of way. Uh, but they, they often get to my website, which does, if you hunt around, have photos of me and, and uh, has a photo of me and my daughter. So that's from Gary Claiborne. I'm guessing he doesn't live in San Francisco. Dear Gary, you're a little late to the party. My daughter is already profoundly ashamed of me. <laughs> Just the other day we were at the playground and a bunch of the dads were playing Torture the Haji. You know this game, Gary, it's really fun. What you do is you find someone who looks like an Arab. It doesn't have to be an actual Arab, though obviously that's the best. And you figure out different ways to torture them, like maybe stress positions or sleep deprivation or simulated drowning mock executions. Those are probably the funnest. Anyway, the guys were playing this great game and all the kids were cheering us on, but I sort of knew the haji we were about to kill. I played squash with them a bunch of times. So I said, 
why don't we just pretend to torture him, guys? And everyone just went silent. Then I heard the most horrible noise. It was my daughter, my little daughter, starting to sniffle. What's the matter, Papa? She cried. Don't you have the moral or spiritual fortitude to interrogate this Haji punk? Are you really so weak and pathetic? Oh my God, why couldn't I have had a brave soldier daddy? And she started sobbing, and the only thing we could do to get her to stop um, was that my best friend Bruce gave her the taser and let her give the Haji a few jolts on his testes. We got photos of that, Gary, if you're interested. So it's kind of a lighthearted book. Very much a... Very much a family book. I, I envision this, I guess, as a, a kind of family book. A family might read together. In the coming apocalypse. Well, you gutless pile of shit. This former, former Marine, uh, which is, if you'd had an A, I would have, it's, it's F-O-M-E-R, but F-O-A-M-E-R, I think would have been awesome. This former Marine would just love it to, in person, here you make those cowardly, useless pile of crap remarks, and you, asshole, would have a very rugged day. I actually think that the use of rugged there is innovative and amazing. So it's, a, it's a great adjectival choice. It's totally unexpected. It sounds like what it is. Uh, so that's from, um, from uh, and so just so you know, I, people say, well, have you sent letters back to these people? I say, no, but I did send them critiques. So I want them to know when, they, when I feel the language is really working. So. We're now in therapy together. All right, Jack Truman, Marine Corps, 1969 to 70, dot, 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 you gutless pile of never served sewage, comma, comma, comma. Interestingly, no chameleon. All right. It's really a, an age divider right there. And it was really to kind of tell who's of that age where we're all fucking old, but we still get stoned. God bless us. Jack, you seem like a really gentle soul. Can I ask your advice on something? My daughter has developed a rather nasty taser habit. It was little stuff at first, squirrels and opossums and your random Arab immigrant, but she's been getting kind of What's the word I want here? Kind of rugged, I guess. <laughs> Meaning she's been taking a poke at some of the other kids at preschool. And you know, I'm sure those little shitballs deserved it and everything. But you also know how goddamn litigious everyone is these days. So here's my question, Jack. Do I take the taser away, or is that against the Second Amendment? All right. Okay, so this other book is uh, made up of essays about uh, sort of writing, the psychology and practice of writing in short shorts. And so I just want to read um, maybe one or two. They're all about 300, 200 words. They're all very short. I think of these as kind of bathroom reading. That's, how, that's my, my, my line. It's kind of a one crap book. <laughs> Hasn't been very successful, I'll be honest with you. Uh, and I should also mention that some of us are going to head over, I'm certainly going to head over to our shelves, the library afterwards. They have uh, wine and booze, and um, I think my daughter's going to be there. If anybody's interested, she'll have a taser. And, uh, get fucked up with it. All right. Uh, so this is a, this little essay called Excessive Emotional Involvement is the Whole Point. Because really, you didn't decide to become a writer for the money or the health insurance plan, did you? It wasn't to make your parents proud. And if you turn to, your, to prose in the hopes of becoming famous, well then, brother, sister, you deserve more pity than contempt. So why then? Here's my guess. Certain volatile feelings went unexpressed in your family of origin and seeped into the groundwater, and you are now hoping to articulate the most shameful of them via the wonders of fictive disguise. I'm not discounting your urgent devotion to language nor your bulging imagination, but I am speaking now of motives, not aptitudes. The problem, of course, is that every family enforces its own codes of silence, and every writer is, in this sense, viol violating some kind of omerta. The question is, 
What's stronger, your compulsion to tell the truth about the things that matter to you deeply or your fear of the consequences? Um, and then there's a couple more of these. Um, uh, I sometimes hear other writers talking about how much they love writing, how they just wrote for 12 hours straight, and how mind-blowing it was to go that deep with their characters. It was like making love to sting. <laughs> and if only they could spend their lives in front of the keyboard and they didn't have to eat or sleep, check email, their lives would be perfect. They could just crank out awesome shit around the clock, like Kerouac, like Steinbeck. Stephen King. Here's what I have to say to these people. Fuck you. <laughs> Better yet, fuck Sting. Because for the rest of us, writing is basically flagellation, an undertaking that promises ecstatic release, but mostly feels like torture. I will do anything to avoid writing. I hate every second of it. The only part of the process I like is having written, which I don't think counts. If you are now wondering why I write, the best answer I can give is that it's the closest I've been able to come to song. I mean by this that my intent is always to reach some unbearable moment where time slows down and the sensual and psychological details compress and the language rises up into what I call the lyric register. The rest is just chewing gum and string. And then the uh, last little bit is called, this is just my bullshit. You can and should find an exception to everything I've said. Only a fool speaks with assurance about something as subjective as artistic creation. So take what you can from this volume and leave the rest behind. But a few reminders before I head back to the cave. Every decision you make matters. It matters that you use the word anxious when you meant eager. It matters that you chose a comma and not a semicolon to separate those independent clauses. It matters that you jump ship with your heroine on the brink of ruin. The reader brings her patient heart to your work. She arrives ready to dream your dream. But if you betray her enough times, if you make a habit of lazy, self-regarding decisions, if you fail to grant your characters the love they deserve, she will find another dream. We are living in an era of screen addiction and capitalist pornography. As a species, we are squandering the exalted gifts of consciousness, losing our capacity to pay attention, to imagine the suffering of others. You are a part of all this. It involves you. This is the hard labor we're trying to perform, convincing strangers to translate our specks of ink into stories capable of generating rescue. I mentioned before, or maybe I didn't, the ancient feeling I get when I read a beautiful story. It's as if I'm a little kid again and something very sad has happened and it's winter and night has blackened the branches above. I'm very stirred up, close to tears actually, because I can see, I've been made to see, the sorrow that everyone is lugging around and the cruel things this sorrow makes them do, and still, I want to forgive them. I want to forgive every last sorry bastard. God, I love that feeling. Thanks, guys.